Thanks for coming, everybody. This is uh, Writing Your Own CLI Tools of PowerShell, a case study of SQL Top. I'm Mark Wilkinson. So who am I? Uh, I'm a father of four. I live in Garner, North Carolina, where it is considerably warmer than it is here, and a lot more sunshine. Um, I did get a little bit of sunshine in my walk this morning, though, so that's appreciated. Uh, I'm a proud horse dad. My daughter rides, and I ride. And uh, it is my thing that I do other than tech, which everybody should have that. Uh, I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, uh, co-host of the uh, Mixed Extents podcast, which is a SQL Server uh, focused podcast, and uh, organizer of the uh, AKB SQL Server Internals Conference. Uh, that is an online conference that was born during COVID. This is actually my first time speaking in front of people in about two years, so I apologize if I'm a little rusty, or if I pick out one person and stare at them awkwardly for the whole talk. I love it. Could be you. All right. <laughs> Uh, also, an engi engi engineering manager at a company in Morrisville, North Carolina, uh, manage a team of DBAs. Uh, if you want to contact me, uh, email address is me at markw.dev. Um, I am taking a break from social media, so if you do have any questions or anything, feel free to shoot me an email um, or come see me or raise your hand and, and speak up. All right, so the goal for today's talk, um, I try to not read slides. Uh, this one I will, though. Uh, the goal of this talk is to inspire you to build your own tools and give you methods to make that easier. Um, I think a lot of, uh, I've ran into a lot of situations in the past where I, I want to build something myself, but uh, I get a lot of pressure to like use a vendor tool or something like that, um, which sometimes that's the right answer, but I think you should always, you should always think about doing things your own, on, on your own if you can. So the agenda for today, uh, first we're going to start with why build tools, uh, go over some of those, the reasons why you might want to do that yourself. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about SQL Top. I'm going to assume nobody in here knows what SQL Top is. Um, any Linux users in the crowd? All right. So <laughs> you'll, you can maybe figure out what SQL Top does. Um, the rest of you, all, I'll show you. And then um, from there, we'll go into some challenges that I faced when writing it uh, and some solutions and then some closing thoughts. Um, little disclaimer, I primarily work in a uh, PowerShell 5.1 environment. There are better ways to do some of the things I'm doing in PowerShell 7, but we don't run PowerShell 7, so I'm not going to do it that way. <laughs> um, but you are free to. Uh, I will also not claim that the ways, that, the things I'm going to show you are the best way to do things, but it's the, it's the ways that work for me. So hopefully, hopefully everybody finds something useful in here. So first, um, the big question, why, why build tools? And, before I even answer that question, I guess I should say, uh, when I'm talking about tools, I'm just talking about like command line utilities and things that can make your life or your team's life easier. Anything that you can write that can take um, you know, some multi-step process and can kind of compact it into something a little smaller that people can quickly you know, run a command and get the information they need to do their job or you know, execute some task in a simpler way. Um, so why build tools? Uh, the tool that you want doesn't exist. I mean, that's, that's obviously the simplest one. Um, but that could mean also that maybe there's like five tools that do the thing you want to do. They all do kind of part of it, but you want something a little simpler. Um, the tool does exist, but it's, it's way too complicated. Um, there was a piece of software that we used to monitor SQL Server. It was fairly expensive. Um, it had this horrible flash interface. It was, it was not a good experience to use the tool. It had one feature that was, that was really great. Um, but it did like a thousand other things we didn't need. So, you know, was it worth it to keep that tool around for that one thing if we could have written our own, you know, thing to, to, uh, to kind of do that, that, that thing that we needed? Um, another reason, and this, is, uh, this one is kind of central to me, um, if I ever want to learn more about a system or a problem that I'm encountering, um, I'll often build some tooling around it. Be it uh, like monitoring uh, type tooling, something that'll you know grab some metrics and stuff them somewhere so I can analyze them. But I, I like to, uh, I, I feel like it's a good way to dive into something and learn more about it. And then uh, finally, your external tool options are constrained. So if you work in like uh, government or like a financial institute or something, and you have a hard like if you've got some uh, some legal process that takes six months before you can even get some new piece of software in, uh, maybe it is time to write something yourself. May not always be the case, but uh, something you should definitely consider. Uh, those first two are the ones that really um, are responsible for most of the custom work that we do at, at my place of work. Um, because we, uh, I get picked on because I often say that our environment is special. Um, I get picked on by Anthony over there. 
he says everybody's environment special, but. <laughs> Yes, everyone does want to be considered special, but nobody is. But I think maybe we are. Um, <laughs> now, we just run a large environment. We use tons of features of SQL Server. Um, it's the kind of thing where every time we have a problem, we go searching on Google, and nobody has any idea what the heck we're talking about. We'll ask in forums, and nobody has any idea. Um, so we often end up building stuff to collect more data so we can, we can troubleshoot issues and things that we're seeing. Um, all right. So, SQL Top. Uh, what is SQL Top? Um, first, I'm actually going to show you Top. So, Top is a uh, is a Linux slash Unix utility. Let me uh, see if I can bring this over. No, it's not. I want to do it all. Here we go. Okay, you can't see that over there. Perfect. Hey, there it is. Look at that. Um, so, Top is a it's a Linux utility. It just shows you all the processes that are running on your box. Um, up at the top there, you can see like uptime, number of users, uh, total tasks running, some CPU metrics, memory, swap space. And the nice thing is that it auto refreshes. You see every, every like two seconds or so to refresh and show you what's going on in your box. Um, this is a great tool when you're trying to figure out what the heck's happening on your servers. But um, nothing really existed like that for SQL. And uh, the throughput on our, in, on our systems is, is so great that it's, it's nice to have some sort of real-time view so you can see what's happening. So that is why I built SQL Top. And I didn't practice this part of the demo, so we'll see how it goes. Let me open it up over here. Whoops. Bear it with me here. Okay, so go to a PowerShell console here. Uh, oh boy, can't type it all today. Okay, so I've got a local instance of SQL running, or at least I certainly should. I forgot I had an issue last night and my computer died, so let me do this real quick. Okay, now I have a local instance of SQL running. <laughs> um, I'll give that a second to spin up. Um, so uh, after that spins up, I'll, I'll show you guys what SQL Top does. But, but what SQL Top tries to do is replicate that, that usefulness of, of Top and showing you, you know, what's running on your box right now. So let me launch this. Post, and we'll use SQL Auth. I'm not going to be happy if this doesn't work. I, I, I've given this talk before, and this didn't work. Um, I have since demoed it about 400 times to myself, and it did work. So looks like we're having a good time so far. Let me. I did. Oh. <laughs> and a win from the audience. I don't know how to spell local host. <laughs> oh, look at that, look at that, it's amazing. All right, so <laughs> this is SQL Top. Um, as you can see, it's a little boring right now because we don't have any, any workload running on it, so let me fix that as well. But, uh, yeah. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, start up a little, another program. Actually, uh, I'm going to be doing a lightning talk later on a, something called Foreman, which is a piece of uh, software that I've been working on. Um, it's a PowerShell module for doing um, database load testing, uh, compatible with anything uh, that has an ADO.NET provider. So I'm going to load up a workload here. After I import this module. Okay, that I right. invoke format. Okay, that should be launching off a ridiculous amount of processes, and it'll show up here in a second. There we go. Okay, so this is SQL Top. It looks very much very similar to Top. You've got a couple, you know, columns and things there that you can look at, but up at the top we've got the host. Uh, we've got the number of processes captured, the number displayed, how much blocking is occurring. 
Um, the updated, that's the last time that the data that we're looking at was actually updated and pulled back from the server. Uh, data refresh rate, that's how often it's attempting to refresh data from the server. And then uh, there's also, man, that ran fast. There's also some uh, highlighted text and filter spid, which is just some, uh, some other options you have when using this. Um, but uh, I'll show you once it starts back up again. So like if I have a specific process that I'm interested in, like let's say process number 86, I just hit S, type 86, and it will show me, ooh, formatted a little weird. I'm running in a strange resolution, so it might look a little bit bizarre, but, um, but this will tell me like the, you know, the process that's running, and it went away already, but it'll tell me the statement that's running, how much memory it's using. Um, I can kill the process from here, all kinds of things. But some of the stuff I wanted to highlight when, when running this tool is uh, the commands menu. Um, that changes, uh, you know, depending on what view you're in. Um, there's a bunch of different views you can get. You can look at weight stats, resource usage, you can get blocking trees, all kinds of stuff. Um, but this was, a, I thought this was a good example of a, of a tool that I spent a little bit of time on to, to kind of show off some, some cool things you can do in PowerShell. So I'm gonna get out of here. That's the, that's the exit message, quitters never win. Just remember that. Uh, all right, let me close out of this, maybe. Oh my gosh, yeah, close it, get out of here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that was SQL Top. Um, and that was the demo, look at that. All right, so challenges when developing uh, SQL Top. Um, I will say that I don't feel like before PowerShell 7 anyways, I don't feel like uh, PowerShell was uh, specifically designed with uh, developing semi-graphical interfaces. Um, I think the PS style stuff is really great. Um, I did not have that available when I wrote this, so there's gonna be a slide where you're gonna be like, why aren't you using PS style? Um, it's because I was using PowerShell 5.1. So challenges, uh, I broke them into a couple categories here. Um, strange system quirks uh, slash environment quirks. Um, smooth UI, UX. Uh, you will quickly gather through this talk that I am kind of uh, obsessed with making sure that the user experience is really good. Um, I hate using tools that are ugly. I don't like using tools that um, are like kind of choppy and hard to use because um, it's just not a good experience and you, you end up thinking about the tool while you're trying to get work done. Um, I like tools that kind of get out of the way and, and just let you do what you need to do. So a lot of the work that I did is gonna be around uh, smooth UI type stuff. And then also keeping code organized. Um, as anybody that's developed any tools internally knows, um, you know, people ask you to add something, you add something, then you add something, then you add something, and after a while you've got this like 2,000 line monster and you don't know where anything is. So keeping stuff organized uh, was, was, was a challenge. So first off, uh, I'll put this one squarely under system quirks. Um, embedded shells in development environments um, can be hard to work with depending on what you're trying to do. ISE, um, I know it's deprecated. A lot of people still use ISE. Uh, SQL top will not work in ISE and, uh, because the read key uh, function is not available in, in, in ISE. Um, and then in VS Code, if I want to set a window title, um, it wasn't obvious in that, in that demo, but if you run this in Windows, it'll set the window title to tell you like CPU usage on the, pro on the server, how many processes are blocking, how many are running, things like that. Um, so you can leave it kind of minimized and, and still know what's going on. But um, that doesn't work in VS Code. Um, there is a global variable called host um, that you can get all kinds of great information out of and you're also able to do things like set the window title. Um, but uh, host.name, will tell you where you're at. So if you do need to develop for these environments, you can use that to figure out what console you're in. Um, my solution was just to ignore this, and uh, <laughs> if people want to run this in ISE, it's just not gonna work, don't do it. Uh, just run it in a console. But you may not have that option, um, or you may want to write something that's gonna run in ISE. Um, and if you do need to, if you do want to do that, you're gonna have to use that host.name to, to figure out what console environment you're in. Um, I, I kind of felt like this was being a web developer, developing for IE6, and I just didn't want to go down that road. Um, so I just, I just ignored it. And uh, if people have problems running in VS Code or ISE, well, they're gonna have problems. <laughs> All right, um, invoke SQL command. I'm using this one as an example commandlet, um, but uh, anybody that's worked with SQL Server and PowerShell has used this. Uh, it's just a, a quick way to run some queries against an instance. Um, talking, I'm using this as a, a talk generally about problematic 
commandlets. Um, invoke SQL command works fine on its own. Uh, once you put it inside of a run space or multiple run spaces, it can start to have really weird errors. Uh, I'm assuming there's some sort of there's some sort of uh, something about it that's not thread safe is what I'm assuming here. I didn't dig too deep into it because uh, I just got frustrated and did something else, <laughs> um, which I do a lot of now, uh, which we'll get to at the bottom there. But um, yeah, invoke SQL command wasn't working in run spaces. Um, for whatever reason, the default error action for invoke SQL command seems to be continue. So if you have an error in your SQL uh, script or you know can't connect to the server or something, it'll throw an error, but it'll just keep moving. Um, I don't really like that. I like stuff to, to fail hard so I know about it and can handle it. Um, and I know I can set my default error action, but I feel like the default error action for everything should be stop, unless I say otherwise. That could just be my opinion. <laughs> um, and also, uh, back to that, you know, why build tools. Uh, invoke SQL command is kind of complex for what I need. Um, I'm just running a query and pulling results back. Um, so in this case, I just use uh, .NET classes. And I, this is something I like to do anytime I run into some sort of issue with a with the commandlet that's built in, you know, stop and think, is this, is this complicated commandlet with all these you know, parameters and features? Is this really what I need to, for you know, this, this simple thing that I'm trying to do, or can I just go right to the, to the .NET classes? Um, so like for this specific one, um, yeah, I'm just using the .NET classes. So this is, this is all happening within a, uh, a script block that's gonna be passed into a run space, but, um, Anybody that has not used .NET objects or .NET classes, um, it's pretty straightforward. So like, for example, here, setting up a new connection, setting up a command, whoops, right there, and then eventually getting our, our data back into a, a results object. So anytime, uh, like I said, anytime I run into some issues with a, you know, a built-in function or something that's not working well, um, just, just know that the .NET classes are always there to, uh, to help you out. Right, so now for the, for the kind of fun stuff. Um, <laughs> Flicker free, mostly, uh, redraws. Um, one thing that um, I enjoy about like top and uh, SQL top now um, is that uh, when it is refreshing that data, it's not jarring, it's not like flashing at you like a strobe light. And that was, um, that was one of the first things that I, that I went about fixing because um, that dr just drives me crazy. So um, I originally, I was just writing stuff in a tight loop, uh, had a clear host on it, which is clear host, invoke SQL command, and it would just keep displaying the data. Um, that was my first attempt at, at creating this tool. It took me like 15 minutes, um, and I had something that was, you know, at least displaying what I wanted to see. Um, but uh, as any developer will say, you know, that's not enough. I need to spend at least six months writing a tool, right? I can't. <laughs> Can't write a tool in 15 minutes, that's no fun. Um, so I went about attacking this Flickr issue that was bothering me, um, and that's what led down the rabbit hole of using run spaces to separate the UI and the data capturing, uh, the data gathering uh, portion of the, of the program, which we'll see in a minute. But um, I ended up using a, a, what I call a pseudo double buffering approach. So when you're, when you're working with uh, graphics, um, there's, a, uh, there's a method called double buffering that where instead of drawing stuff to the screen line by line, you stuff everything into, um, into a buffer that's you know, not being displayed on the screen and then just slap it on the screen essentially. Um, in PowerShell you can do that by basically drawing your, your screen into a string array and then just drawing the whole array to the screen at one time. Um, it, gets rid of, uh, it gets rid of any jerkiness or anything in your, when, you're, when you're outputting your text. Um, and then also I'm uh, just blanking portions of the screen that I want to rewrite. So I'm not blanking the whole screen every time, um, I'm just blanking you know, the portions that are gonna be refreshed. And I've got some, uh, some example code here. Uh, for the example, since the, I'm not gonna lie, the SQL top code has gotten a little unwieldy. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on breaking it up and making it a little bit nicer. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, um, I am going to be using the uh, get process command um, and uh, creating a SQL top-ish kind of, kind of thing using that, um, which, uh, oh, hold on. Where is that at? I gotta find it now. There it is. Um, and since I don't like ISE, I decided to choose the ISE color scheme just to uh, <laughs> be a little nostalgic, I guess. But um, all right, so this is a good representation of the first, my first stab at writing, um, you know, SQL top. Um, 
that looks horrible, right? Like, yes, it's giving you the information, but nobody wants to look at that. If you're, you know, if you're firefighting some issue, you don't want this thing flashing in your face, right? That's terrible. So instead, um, instead of writing eight lines of code, you can write a lot more code, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you can get your thing done that way. But so the important, I mean, it is a lot of code, but a lot of it's comments, and none of it's that complicated. But um, so, you know, what we're what we're doing here, you know, we're doing the Git process, sorting it, we're selecting the first ten. Uh, doing an outstring, and then we're sleeping, okay? For the more complicated version, um, first thing I'm doing is uh, creating, I'm, I'm filling up a variable called blanks. Um, you'll notice I got 12 lines here, right? I've got these 10 here, and then I've got two header lines, so 12 lines total. So blanks is just uh, storing 12 lines worth of blank spaces, basically, in a, in a variable that I can use to um, clear what's on the screen. Okay, and then I'm using the same command, this get process, except I'm, I'm dumping it into a variable called output. Um, I'm also using this uh, console cursor visible equals false. So um, one thing you'll notice with this, uh, this terrible example is that you see this cursor blinking at the top just to make this extra annoying. Um, I didn't want that. So uh, cursor visible false gets rid of that flashing because it hides the cursor. So what I do is I get the output, I hide the cursor, I use this uh, global host. Um, oh, by the way, um, I didn't update my code because, like I said, I was not running this on PowerShell 7 before, but, um, oh, wait, no, this is PowerShell 7. Oh, sorry. When you're using host in run spaces, just as, a, as an aside, um, make sure to uh, put global on it um, or else I can't find it. It is a global variable, but for whatever reason, when you, uh, when you, specify, when you, when you just re reference it by just host inside of a run space, it, it can have some issues. But uh, this is not in a run space, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about that. But anyways, um, the, this, this uh, cursor position here just sets the X and Y coordinates of the cursor. So, so far we've got our data, setting the cursor to non-visible, pushing it into the upper left-hand corner, and we're gonna draw our blanks, and then we're gonna set the cursor back up to the top, and then we're gonna draw our output, and then make the cursor visible again, and then we're gonna sleep. So yes, it is a bit more code. Look how pretty that is, right? It's nice and smooth, we're not gonna have a bunch of flashing, um, nobody's gonna get irritated and punch their computer because it's, uh, it's flashing at them and looking annoying. Um, so yeah. So it's, uh, it is a little bit of extra code, but it's a lot nicer effect and makes for a lot nicer uh, user experience. Whoa. All right. So that was that. Next up. Any questions so far, by the way? No? Okay. Grab a drink of water. I'm trying really hard, folks who are I don't know if this is being streamed or not, but I'm trying really hard not to unscrew my cap right on the microphone. Okay, so sharing data in state. Um, one issue you can have if you, uh, like even that, that last nice smooth, buttery smooth thing I just showed you, um, if you have a menu at the bottom, um, you can't really interact with the menu very easily because it's drawing and then it's sleeping for 200 milliseconds and then drawing. You know, where do you put the stop to grab your, uh, your user's input? You don't want to, uh, you don't want to sacrifice refreshing the screen and showing the user useful data because you're waiting for them to press a key. You know, you don't want to draw the screen and then wait 20 seconds or whatever for the user to press a key and then draw the screen again. So one of the best ways that I could come up with to handle this is to separate the data capture portion into a run space. So that way it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. So what happens is you uh, capture the data in, uh, in a run space. There's a, there's a variable that's shared between the, the host process and then that, that run space that's running. And uh, as it's updating data, it's populating it into that shared variable. And then the UI is reading that shared variable to, to display it on the screen. Um, what you end up with is that uh, you can refresh the data as quickly or as slowly as you want. But for the UI portion, um, you can put that in a fairly tight loop waiting for user input, and those two things can happen at, you know, different intervals. And uh, again, it just allows for a lot nicer user experience. Um, when I was showing you SQL Top, um, it doesn't matter what was going on on the screen, I could hit a button at any time for one of the menus, and the menu would pop right up, or it would do exactly what I wanted it to do. 
Um, if I wanted to quit, I didn't have to wait for some process to get done loading before it let me quit, that kind of thing. Um, so adding run spaces does add complexity. Um, I use run spaces a lot uh, because uh, I, I find them useful. Um, some of the stuff that I've had to write at my, my current employer, um, like a database deployment uh, process that I, that I had to create, will deploy to like 250 databases, 300 databases at a time. Um, that's not something you want to do in serial. Uh, so that is where I really learned how to use run spaces. So now I can remember how to use them. Because I know the syntax isn't amazing. It's not great to use. But now that I know how to use them, I, I tend to use them pretty frequently, uh, even for simple things like this. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use run spaces, um, use a synchronized data type. That's a thread safe data type um, so that the, uh, you know, those two threads can interact with the data. Um, and then I'll show you about, uh, we're going to use something called synchronized hash table. I'm assuming most people here use hash tables. Um, I say they're magical because I, I love how you don't have to actually add properties to them. You can just say this dot that equals whatever, and it just creates it for you. I love that. But uh, all right, let's take a look here at an example. Whoops, oh boy, that's not what I want to do. Here we go. I don't think I closed it, but all right, so. Uh, this is a, I don't, how many of you have used run spaces here before to do anything? Okay. So run spaces, um, essentially what you're doing is uh, you're kind of starting a whole new, like a, a child process basically that's a, a, another session, another PowerShell session that's just running, running code for you. Um, so I'm going to just, as an example, just so you have an idea, um, we're going to create some hash tables here. We're going to add hello to them. I'm going to create a script block um, that adds world to the end of the, uh, the variable here. Okay. Then I'm going to create a run space. Whoa. All right, so I'm going to create a run space here. And then uh, this, this last line here, session state proxy set variable, what this is going to do is it's going to take that run space hash, this hash table right here, and it's going to uh, expose it to the uh, to the run space, so the run space knows about this variable that lives in this in this host pro in the uh, the parent process here. All right, and then I'm going to create a uh, a new instance of a PowerShell here, and then I'm going to attach the run space, and then I'm going to run it. So when I do that, uh, the the code that we're running is it's supposed to, supposed to change the data property of run space hash to world, or to uh, hello world, and then this hash.data is supposed to be also changed to hello.world. But we only passed in run space hash. So if we, if we look at the, uh, the results here, it only appended it to the one that it could see, this run space hash. The reason I wanted to show you this more simplified version of what I'm about to show you is just to understand that um, if you are using run spaces and you need to affect things that uh, you know the, the the parent process can see, um, this set this uh, session state proxy set variable is a really good way to do it. There's a couple other ways to do it, uh, depending on what you need to do, but there are ways to to make that happen. So on to something a little different. So this is um, a lot of this code is what we have already looked at. Um, you know, like we're doing this get process thing here, like we did before. But uh, there's a few differences here. So let me, I'm sorry, I did not format this for this resolution. But so first thing I'm doing, uh, creating a synchronized hash table um, called state data. Uh, this is just a variable called stop. It's just for loop control. When I get into the UI portion of it, it's just going to do while, not stop. Um, it's just going to loop forever until the user decides to stop. Go ahead. Yeah, so there's, um, this is using the, the .NET class for system collections at hash table, and then um, using synchronize. What synchronize does is it ensures that the hash table is thread safe. So if multiple threads are trying to interact with it, they don't step on each other or cause like, you know, any sort of errors or anything like that. Um, I don't, I don't know if I always have to use this when I use run spaces. I tend to, to use it anyways, just in case, so I don't run into strange issues, um, but, um, but yeah, that'll ensure that if you are altering this object in two locations, it's, it's, you're not going to run into any issues. Is there an error when that happens, or what happens if that gracefully... I don't remember. 
I would have to, uh, I could probably write a, a, I'm not gonna write a demo right now because I know it'll fail. But um, <laughs> if none of you were here, I could write a quick demo in three minutes that would explain it. But um, that can't happen when you're in front of a crowd. So um, I don't know, I would, have to, I would have to try it out and see. But, uh, but, but okay, so we're creating our synchronized hash table. Uh, there is a, we're creating a, you know, a property called has data, setting that to false. Um, same thing as in our simpler version, we're creating a new run space and adding that state data to it. Uh, this is a script block of what's gonna run inside of the run space. So we're just getting that process uh, data that we're gonna display. Um, same thing as before, creating a new instance of PowerShell here, adding a run space. We're adding that script. Um, this is a habit of mine, in case anybody's questioning me. Um, yes, I know I can pipe this to, whoa, I can pipe this to out and all. Um, I, for whatever reason, got into the habit of doing it this way. Um, when you add a script to a, uh, when you add a script like this, that it, it outputs something, but you don't need to capture that output, so I just assign it to null. And then I capture this handle here. So when you run uh, begin invoke, it will run uh, whatever you have in this run space. It'll run it asynchronously. Asynchronously. Um, so it's not gonna block and wait for it to finish running. You can use run spaces such that if you uh, just run invoke, it'll run the script, blocking your current process as well, and then return. Um, using begin invoke, it'll, it'll fire it off asynchronously. And then um, you can use this handle here later to then retrieve the output of it um, when, when, it's all done, when it's all done running. You can also use that to check in on the state of it to see if it's completed, if it's had errors, things like that. And that brings us down to our main, this is the UI portion of it. So we set stop to false, which I think I did that at the top too. All right, because I'm just being safe. So <laughs> set stop to false, and then uh, while not stop, this is our UI loop. So this is where we're gonna do all of our display work. So just like before, you know, with setting the cursor to be uh, invisible, putting it up in the upper left corner, doing all that stuff um, that we did before. This time, um, I'm actually adding a menu too. So this uh, queue for quit. And uh, so what this does it now, what this, what this loop is gonna do now, if you look at the, this script block up here, it's gonna sleep for two seconds between refreshes. And then, sorry, I'll stop scrolling here. Um, <laughs> and after it refreshes, it's gonna set has data to true. This is, the, this is a way for the, the run space process to signal to the UI component that there's something available for you to display. So then when I'm in the UI loop here, what I can do is while there's not data to display, this is where I watch and see if uh, a user has pressed a key, a menu key to like get out of the, get out of the program or you know, sort it in some way or whatever. Um, if there is not data, it'll just keep on you know, redrawing this, this screen here. So we'll, uh, we'll run this and I'll show you how this looks here. So again, it's refreshing like it, whoa. <laughs> Refreshing like it was before, looks nice, but now we get the queue to quit. So remember the, the background process that's pulling in the, the process data, um, it's, it's got a two second wait on it. Normally if you have a start sleep for two seconds in your program, it's gonna sleep. It's gonna sit there and you're not gonna be able to do anything. Since it's running in the background and my main UI loop is doing its own thing on its own time, I can hit queue at any time and it immediately quits out of the app. You know, we don't have to wait for anything. So, um, the way that I discovered this is that um, when I was writing SQL Top, you know, when you have a tool like Top where you're trying to look at how something is performing, um, typically you're not hopping on servers that are having a really good day, right? You're not like, hey, let's connect to the server and see how happy it is. Um, usually that server is on fire, and so when you're running a query that is supposed to take a few milliseconds and ends up taking like two minutes to run, um, you're already frustrated by taking two minutes and you don't want to sit there and wait for that to finish before you can actually get out of this program to uh, go figure out what else you can do. Um, so by separating, the, you know, by separating those, those two processes and uh, allowing the UI to, to be very responsive even when you know, everything else is just in the garbage on the back end, um, it, just, it makes it a lot easier to use and you don't have to uh, close your, your PowerShell console in anger as frequently. Any questions about this? No? Cool. 
Let me see if I can get my other thing back. Hey, is that it? Yeah, it is. Look at that. All right, boom. Uh, quickly, uh, yeah. The, your, your, your query has data. So uh, it, I, I, it's probably in the code, but I just think, where do you, where do you reset it to false? I knew that. The question was uh, that has data. Uh, we set it to true in the run space, but where is it then set to false um, so that the uh, the main UI part knows how to knows that it needs to look for user input? Um, let me show you that it is in the code. I think it should be, or else it wouldn't run, right? Let me <laughs> let me uh, let me see here. Uh, where was that? Oops. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Right there. So at the end of the uh, at the end of the loop, it'll set it back to false. Okay. All right. Let me close that back out. Okay. By the way, there is a uh, there is a GitHub repo that I hopefully put a link to at the end of this presentation. But um, there is a GitHub repo that has all these little code samples in it. Um, I tried to, uh, originally when I wrote this, I tried to include a lot of uh, like snippets of SQL Top itself, but like I said, it's kind of an animal. Um, so I tried to create smaller pieces of code that are a le little easier to understand, something that you could potentially take into your environment and just copy and paste and change a few things and it would work for you. So hopefully that is, that is true. So this is, uh, this is where I wish I knew about PS style and wish I was on PowerShell 7. Um, so pretty colors, that's important to everybody, right? Like you need that in your, in your programs, right? Um, there is usefulness in colors. Uh, like the, if you saw in the original, when I was showing you the demo SQL top, all the menu keys were, were highlighted in green. Um, there was alternating color rows that makes it a lot easier to look across the data and figure out what you're looking at. So there's usefulness in colors other than making stuff look cool. Um, but it does make stuff look cool, so that's important too. But, um, but yeah, so coloring line by line is hard um, in PowerShell. Um, coloring specific words can be hard, especially when you're, when you're dealing with the output of something like get process, or in my case, the output of, uh, of a, SQL, a SQL query. Um, so I just cheated, and um, I, the whole UI, the whole center portion, um, which we have saw in some of the examples already, is just one big string. Um, so I don't have to, uh, I don't have to worry uh, so much about um, trying to figure out how to pull specific pieces out. It's just one big string, so I can iterate through it and uh, kind of alter the alter the string as I iterate through it. Um, and I'll show you, I'll show you that in a second here. Um, this is also. Um, this, uh, I couldn't figure out the color thing initially when I was doing, writing SQL top. But then I got really frustrated with that flickering part and thought about the double buffering thing, and stuffing it all into a variable. Then when all that data was in the variable, I'm like, oh hey, now I can, now I can do the color thing. So that's how this, this came to be. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Um, so I wrote a, why wouldn't you come over here? Okay. <laughs> um, I wrote a little, a little helper function um, that I use in quite a few of my uh, my, my scripts here um, called uh, color. And this is where my frustration with PS style comes in because uh, pretty much all of this stuff is defined in PS style. And I could have pulled it out of there <laughs> instead of looking up all these ridiculous codes for ASCII escape sequences. But um, I've got a little helper function called color. Um, it takes in some text, a foreground color and a background color and, uh, and, and spits out a string using these ASCII escape codes. Now, why am I not just using write host? Uh, the advantage of using this is that you can embed colors within a string. Um, so when, it, when after you, what it does is it spits out this horrible thing down here at the bottom. Um, which, why did you write a helper function, Mark? You can't remember this? Um, <laughs> So this, is, uh, this has all the, uh, the escape characters in it, including this one at the end to reset, um, to, to colorize your text. Um, there was a time when I had, co when I had this specific text embedded um, in several places, and the code, it, it was just impossible to look at. So I decided to write a little helper function. Um, no, it is not using an approved verb, because I wanted to keep it short. <laughs> it's also not a function that I expose externally. Um, I literally just copy and paste this function right into the code of whatever I'm working on. 
Um, so I can use it like this here. So let me, let me get this function loaded up here. So the way you use this is just like this. So you can still use right host, um, but you say color your text, the color of the text, and uh, it'll output all of the proper escape characters to do stuff like this that you can barely see at the bottom there. Let me run that again. So as you can see, the hay is green, the folks is white. Such a thrilling demo, right? So, um, but yeah, so anywhere that I need to colorize things, I can just use this little color helper function. Um, it doesn't, it visually doesn't take up a lot of space in my code, so I'm not confused like what I'm looking at, where I'm at. Um, so in a larger example, this is again the same thing as uh, like our first uh, smooth refresh uh, no flicker demo here, but now I've added some, whoa, there. I've added some alternating color rows. So that can make it a lot easier to look at, a lot easier to you know track a line with your finger or whatever. Um, and the way that I'm doing this, so since uh, we're already treating this, um, all this data as strings here, I'm using out string, uh, I'm streaming it to a for each object. And I'm just using a simple, uh, I'm just setting a, a variable here called row equals zero. I'm just modding two, and if it equals a zero, I'll set the color of the line, the current line, to, to cyan. If it's, if it's uh, not equal to zero, it'll just, uh, you know, it'll output the line unaltered. Um, and then it'll increment the row counter. So this is just a, a quick way to, to add alternating colors. <coughs> now if I were gonna rewrite this for PowerShell 7, I would still have this helper function. Uh, my point with that was just that instead of trying to remember all this nonsense, um, or trying to, maintaining that nonsense anyways, um, I would just use all the built-in uh, built properties and stuff that are available in PS style. Any questions about any of that? All right, let me get back here. Oh yeah, I did have another little example here. So, um, why is this being weird? There we go. Let's see here. Yeah, so it, it's a little bit more complicated in SQL Top, um, but uh, here is how it is handled um, in SQL Top. Again, we're still using that color function, but I've got a little extra stuff. Um, so, when uh, when it's displaying processes, uh, system processes, there's a there's a column, uh, the far left column of SQL Top is used just for I use, it's a general purpose column I use for a few things. But uh, one thing when you're in that main view is it'll put an S next to any process that's a system process. It'll put uh, a letter B uh, next to any process that is blocking other things but is not blocking, being blocked itself. So it's like a lead blocking process, something I might want to kill or something. Um, but so what this is doing is it's, you know, if the line starts with an S, it's making it yellow, so that makes it pop out. If it starts with a B, it's making it red, so that I know that that could be, you know, a problem process that I might want to kill. Um, that next line there, on line 900 there, um, if I'm filtering on a, uh, if I'm filtering some text, uh, there's a, a, a feature where you can type in some text and it will highlight any any processes that have that text in it, be it a username, a database that it's accessing, anything like that, it'll, it'll float it up to the top and highlight it in white. Um, so that's, you know, that code handles that. Um, if none of that is met and uh, it is an odd column, is it odd? Yeah, even? No, oh, that's weird. I don't know why I did a mod two equals one, that's bizarre. But, um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, this is what handles the alternating colors if it is not uh, anything that needs to be handled special. Um, but yeah, I could add any number of you know different formatting options and stuff on here, and then uh, I don't think I I didn't highlight it. But let me show you my terrible menus. Um, <laughs> so here is one of the menus um, for switching to the different uh, the different types of uh, views. And again, I'm just using the, that color helper function to highlight the first letter in each uh, in each menu. When I was going to originally include a lengthy demo on menus. Um, but me being the person that I am, um, I was looking at my menu code and didn't really like it and started writing like a menu generation module because why wouldn't you do that when you're just trying to prepare for a presentation about something you already wrote? Um, 
But uh, most, of the, most of the menu logic is just simple if-else type stuff. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit about menus, but just not as in-depth as this is. Um, but for the most part, I'm just using if-else, uh, a big if-else uh, statement to handle all of my menus. But anyways, all right, so that brings us to user input. Um, so, read host is great. Um, it doesn't cover all use cases. I don't like when people have to, like for example, if you've got a menu and uh, you want it to be accessible via a single key press, um, I don't really want people to have to then press enter, um, which again is just a little UI quirkiness thing about me maybe. Um, but that's why we've got this fantastic uh, raw UI.readKey method. Um, it is a way to read a single key press. Uh, the thing about it is it does block, it waits for the user to press a key and then it will block the, uh, it'll block the thread. So you can't just put it in a loop and call it because it'll sit there and wait for the user input, which is exactly what we want to avoid. But there's another thing available in that host uh, global uh, object there called key available. Um, that does not block. And you can continuously check key available and it'll tell you if a key was pressed. And then if a key was pressed, you can call read key and it'll grab that key press. So for all of my menuing needs, um, I'll usually have a, a loop waiting for key available, and then uh, if there is a key pressed, it'll, it'll read the key and then, and then do what you want with it. Um, the cool thing about read keys, you can capture any key. So not just letters, not just you know, you know, letters and numbers, but you can capture you know, the function keys, the escape key, uh, the enter key, really any key the user can press almost. There's a few. Obviously, if there's, you know, Windows has, like, you're not going to be able to hit print screen because um, Windows will intercept that or whatever OS you're using will intercept that. But for the most part, any other keys can be used, which also adds a lot of flexibility, again, to your, your input for your users. Um, some knowledge that you don't really need to know, but uh, average key press of a human is 50 milliseconds. <laughs> so if you keep your, uh, if you, you, can, you can keep your, your loops waiting for user input, you can keep them pretty tight. Uh, and not, uh, not fear missing any, uh, any user input. So I've got a, uh, a little demo here on various user input methods here. Let me... All right here. Okay, let me clear that. Okay, so uh, we've, I've got a few different, uh, different ones here. This is, uh, what this does is it, it waits for this uh, key available. And then once it detects that the key of, if there is a key available, it will grab the key. And then it'll spit out what you, uh, what you entered. The, the thing that I wanted to really drive home with this one is the fact that it doesn't block while it's waiting for the user input. So you can see within that loop, it's 100 milliseconds and it's gonna print a dot. So it's just gonna print dots until I hit a key. Um, just again to show you that you can, you can do actual work while you're waiting for the key to be pressed, um, and this key available won't block while you're while you're doing that. So I've you know it's, it's printing dots, which is a, really a great demo. It's really thrilling, and uh, you press a key, it'll tell you what you what you pressed. Um, this output is really kind of cool. Um, this is exactly what read key captures. Um, so it captures not only the character but also the virtual key code. Um, so. Obviously, like escape, like if we run this again, escape is not gonna have a character associated with it, but it does have a virtual key code of 27. So if you want your application to close when someone hits escape, you can just listen for key code 27 or you know, whatever else you wanna do. You could tie F1 to help, things like that, assuming the OS doesn't intercept F1, which it might. <laughs> but uh, this is a useful little chunk if you don't know what the key code is um, you can run this, this code here, and uh, anything, anytime you press a key, well actually, and you check that out, see that control key state, it knows if you're holding down shift when you hit the key as well, which is kind of cool. But this just sits in a loop um, until I hit Q anyways. It'll sit in a loop and allow me to figure out uh, what, you know, what all the various key codes are. Ooh, not F11 though. That is a full screen key, right? But, um, but yeah, so that'll, uh, and it's pretty fast. You can just keep typing and it'll, it'll return everything. But that's useful when you're trying to design your menus and want to know what those key codes are. Um, you, can also, you can also implement the ever so important 
press any key to continue. Um, using read host, you can only press enter to continue, but you know, who wants to find a key when you can just slam your hands on the keyboard? So the, uh, and this will do that, just press any key to continue. Um, so <laughs> I actually, uh, this was um, a feature request <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in the, the database deployment software. So the, the database deployment tool that I wrote, uh, it runs in uh, Azure DevOps, uh, a build pipeline. Um, but that same code can also be used by the developers on their desktops to manually deploy stuff to our development environment um, if they want to. And uh, at the, there's a few prompts at the end if you want to like script, uh, like if you just deployed some database objects, it'll ask you if you want to re-script them from the database so you can check them into uh, source control. But there's a few things that it does. But um, it used to say press enter to continue. And I got a user request saying, can we change that to press any key? <laughs> so I had to figure out how to do that. <laughs> and that's where read key came in. That also shows you that no matter how much time you spend designing a tool, it's the small details that people are going to notice. <laughs> um, and then I, this, is, uh, this is using the, the virtual key code to, to wait for a specific key. So what we're doing here is we're, you know, we're reading a key. Well, what we're doing is we're sitting in a while loop, waiting for a key. Um, if the virtual key code is not equal to 27, we just keep repeating our message of press escape to continue. So you can press any keys you want to, and it won't actually stop until you press escape. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with these, if you combine these two things. And that is essentially how the menus are structured in, uh, in SQL Top. Um, I am, like I said, working on a menu module. I don't know when I'll deploy that, but uh, it should allow you to uh, create uh, kind of like a hash table of what you want your menu to look like, pass it into this function, and then you'll be able to you have a single menu object that you can use to, uh, to like gather user input or you know, do whatever you want to do in your application. Because I tend to use a lot of menus. So this, uh, this actually, there's a lot of code involved with this um, in SQL Top. But um, anytime I switch a view in SQL Top, I'm displaying different columns. Um, I've got a different default sort order. Um, there's not a really good way to organize that. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to embed a bunch of code in my menu, like my if else, where I'm, like I didn't want my if else to have a bunch of calls to that, uh, to that run space or whatever to like resort and restructure the data. So what I, uh, what I ended up doing is, um, stuffing everything into a hash table of hash tables, because um, that's not confusing. It's somehow less confusing than doing it in alternate ways. Um, it'll be less confusing when I show you. But um, this, was, uh, this was the only way I could figure out to organize this, you know, this specific information. Um, it, it can get really messy really fast when you uh, start adding more and more views, because as we started using the tool, people were like, oh, this is great. Can you add a blocking view? Sure, I can add a blocking view. Can you add this? Why not? It's just code, um, but after a while, it's a lot of code, and uh, it's hard to it's hard to keep it organized. So this was a, a way I figured out to to keep it organized. Um, so, is everybody in here uh, familiar with the concept of splatting? Yeah. Anybody not familiar with splatting? Okay. So um, splatting is a way in a PowerShell. So if you've got a function that's got or a command that's got like four different parameters that you want to pass it. Um, you can create a hash table that has those parameters defined as key value pairs, and then you just pass the whole hash table to the function, and it'll, it'll plug it into all of the different you know, parameters that you need to plug it into. Um, I've, got a, I've got a blog post on it, if anybody's interested, um, specifically for dealing with optional parameters, because um, those can be kind of a pain. But, um, but yeah, yeah, check this out if you want to know a little bit more about splatting. But um, here's a super simple example. So invoke SQL command, you pass it a server instance, a query, and a database. Uh, using splatting, you just create a hash table with those values in it. And then you pass it to invoke SQL command. Um, and instead of using the dollar sign, you have to use the at. But. Which makes your code much more readable than destroying 14 parameters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it makes it a lot more readable. Um, 
this is like kind of silly, but it also makes really nice, uh, it, it works really well in presentations <laughs> um, because, you know, sometimes you're at limited resolutions and stuff. But no, code readability is a real thing, right? Like if your code's not readable, it's hard to maintain. Nobody's going to want to touch it. So yeah, splatting can definitely help in situations where you want to make your code more readable, um, especially when you have a lot of parameters that you're dealing with. Um, what am I doing? All right, so... I will show you kind of how I did it. Um, this is uh, this part of my talk is kind of aspirational. Um, <laughs> the 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 SQL top code is not beautiful. Um, it was definitely written um, when I needed it to be written. Um, so there's a lot of things in there that I want to fix. Uh, so this slide is kind of um, do as I say, not as I do. It's uh, it is how it should probably be done in SQL top. I just haven't gotten around to fixing it yet. And I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I figure if I get the idea out there, I'll have pressure to, to fix my code, right? Um, all right, so we're going to do the same thing, the same code. We're still grabbing, um, we're still doing a lot of the same stuff here, right? We've got our hash table. We're creating our run space. Um, this is new. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, we've got the same kind of loop here going for the most part. Uh, we're getting the... Uh, Whoops, where is my, where is that? No, 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 where'd it go? Where is, oh, here it is, jeez. <laughs> um, we're, we're, doing this, uh, we're doing this loop where we get process and we're setting the, you know, has data equals true. So a lot of this is the same thing that we've been, we've been kind of iterating on uh, throughout the talk. What is new? Um, I've now defined a variable called view. Uh, this is gonna hold what view of the data we're currently looking at. And now here is my hash table of hash tables. So what we have here, we've got something called the sort option, something called display options. Um, so if we are sorting by threads, we are gonna sort by the number of threads descending and the CPU. If we're sorting by CPU, we're just gonna be sorting by CPU descending. Display options is the same kind of deal. Um, so this is gonna affect what columns are displayed. Um, I have a caveat that you can't read because it is cut off. Um, but when you are, and I would love if someone in the, in the room raised their hand and told me I was wrong here, because I hate this. But um, <laughs> I'm using format table to, to format this data out of get process. And uh, when you are specifying uh, columns that you want to format, uh, to, to display or format in a special way, um, you have to specify all of the columns that you want to see. So by default, get process outputs like five or six columns. Um, if you wanted to reformat one of those columns, you have to kind of like re-implement the formatting for all of those columns if you still want all of the same columns displayed, um, which is kind of a pain. So when you're using format table and you're, you're trying to use this method, just be aware that um, if you just add one column in here, it's only gonna display one column. Um, it's not gonna display that column plus everything that's there by default and nobody raised their hand, so apparently it is that way, uh, which is unfortunate, because I was hoping it wasn't. Um, I also had tried adding like just a star on the end here just to see if it would just display all the stuff it normally did. It doesn't, it just displays everything. Um, so that was not great. But what we've got in here, so we've got that, remember we've got this view variable. So we use, Yes, that is better. That is better than what I'm doing, so yes. Uh, the suggestion was to, instead of just piping this directly to, I'm already, am I already doing a select? I'm not. So instead of just piping this uh, data directly to sort object and format table, uh, we could pipe it to select object, select just the columns we're interested in, and then I could just add, uh, oh, I guess I would still have to, no, no, yeah, then I could do this, and then I could put a star on here. And so just the column, you know, if I need one column, like that thread count that's normally not in there, I could add that and then just put a star on it and it would include everything else from the select. I like that. I like that. Thank you. All right, so, um, but yeah, so we've, we've got this view variable defined and we're just going to use that to index into these two hash tables um, and then pass the resulting, the resulting uh, array here into uh, both sort object and format object, or format table, which we have down here. 
So this is, a, this is the UI loop part of it. Let me scoot this out of the way. Um, so what we're doing is uh, that data that was there, that was, that was put into, uh, you know, in the run space, uh, we're sorting it, and then we're gonna, we're gonna pass it the sort options.view. So when it's CPU, it'll pass it you know, this. When it's threads, it'll pass it this. And this is how everything generally works in SQL top as well. Um, I like this method because you can put all of your sort and display logic in one chunk, you know, anywhere. You could even put it in an external file if you wanted to. Um, and then you only have to worry about this part of it, you know, the, the sorting and everything of it. You only have to worry about this once. Um, I'm a huge fan of only having to worry about things once. Uh, sometimes I'll go through great, great pains in my code to make sure I only have to do it once. Because um, as, soon as, you, as soon as you start spreading, copying and pasting the same chunk of code throughout your code, inevitably next week, um, you're going to you're gonna have to make a little tweak to that piece of code. And you're going to miss like four instances of where you pasted it. So yeah, whenever you can consolidate code um, and, and find kind of creative ways to do that, definitely try to do that. Um, a nice thing too is uh, when you have this kind of setup of these hash tables, you can add all kinds of comments here to let people know what's going on, why it's happening, things like that. Um, but yeah, so in this in this version of it, you know, we're doing the sorting and the formatting based on uh, what that view variable is. Um, I've also got a new variable called redraw. Um, I have that uh, again for UI niceties. Um, when you change the column format, I just like to clear the screen before I do that. But, um, and then the same old stuff we've been doing. So you know, moving the cursor up, drawing our blanks, and then finally writing that result out. Um, this one too, I added this. Uh, this is something I do in SQL top, um, mostly for debugging purposes. I like to know how long ta things take, especially when I start formatting and sorting things. Um, so I just added a little output here to, to figure out how long it took to actually render the UI portion of the code. Um, and then we've got a little more complicated menu. Uh, which I didn't incorporate coloring for some reason, but uh, we can press Q to quit, C to sort by CPU, T to sort by thread count. And then here's that user input that we already, you know, we looked at in the last example. So we're, uh, if there's a key available, we'll read the key. And then uh, if it's Q, we will uh, we'll set stop to true, which breaks this outer while loop um, and, you know, dispose of our run spaces. If we hit C, we're gonna change that view variable to CPU change that redraw to true, and then we'll clear the host. And then uh, same thing for threads. If it's, uh, if it's T, we'll set that variable to, uh, to threads, which will pull in all of our sorting and, and, and display options for the threads. What? Oh, man. I did. This audience is on top of it. That's what I get for typing, right? I should have just recorded this. Yeah, I know, it's this ISE color scheme. Who, who did this? This is the worst. Um, all right, so oh, let, me, let me grab this so it doesn't do that thing. Eh, oh my gosh, my mouse. Got it, boom, okay. Okay, so here we go. I mean, plus that just looks cool, right? The render time, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but here we go, same thing, right? We're just, just we're, we're sorting by uh, CPU in this case, displaying these certain columns. Um, then you hit T, it immediately goes into a thread view, uh, shows everything by thread count. Um, big shocker, the SQL server is consuming all the resources. But um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so this kind of incorporates everything that we've been talking about. Uh, the refresh is nice and fast. Um, switching between views is nice and fast. Um, there's, no, you know, there's no lag or anything in there for the user, and you can immediately quit out of it. So I will say that it does break sometimes. Um, it doesn't, the, the methods I'm showing you here, they don't like window resizing. Sometimes, um, but no. Even on uh, even on full screen on um, what is that a two K display? Yeah, even even full screen on like a two K display, like font size ten or something. Um, I still don't see any sort of flashing or anything from the refresh. So it's 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 pretty solid. All right. All right. So that was that. 
was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is how SQL top is, is kind of structured. Um, if I just showed you this code, I could totally lie and say that I have everything nice and nice and organized at the top. But if you go through my code, you'll see that's not true. Um, <laughs> for the most part, um, all of the logic for what's going to be displayed and how it's going to be sorted is controlled here. Uh, there are some parts lower in the code, specifically in the menu logic, where I had to like set some special variables and stuff. But still, um, it's really nice that I can come up here and just change some formatting really quick. So this is format table, so it allows me to do things like uh, setting alignment and number of decimals. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, so like for object tracking. So I've got a view where you can see resource usage by stored procedure that's executing. So to display the, uh, the stored procedure name, the number of worker threads, uh, number of blocked calls, uh, CPU usage memory, so on and so forth. And then uh, for weights, I've got a totally different set of columns. Uh, and that's, that's for the display portion of it. And then down here somewhere in the depths of the code. There we go, got our sort options. So then this is where I'm defining where, how everything is sorted. Um, and you can do fun things like this. Like, so in the object mode, uh, if there's not a stored procedure associated with it, it'll just return no associated procedure as the name. Um, I don't really, if I'm looking at things, if I want to know what stored procedure is consuming the most uh, resources, I don't really care about things that aren't stored procedures. So this little uh, block, this little expression just sorts those to the bottom. Um, so I don't have to look at them. Um, and yeah, yeah, so like uh, resource usage, uh, this filter thing. Um, if you're highlighting a certain piece of text, uh, you know, if you've hit T and you highlighted some text, uh, this this line makes sure that everything is uh, everything that you want to look at is 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 moved up to the top. But uh, but again, the nice thing about having the code organized like this is that it's really easy to go in here and and change how this how this works and not have to worry about uh, like combing through. What is this? Uh, a thousand lines of code to to figure out where the heck that happened. It's all it's all up at the top there. I was already in here. What am I doing? All right. Final thoughts. <laughs> uh, PowerShell and .NET classes, uh, they're super powerful. Use it when it makes sense. Um, I used to not like using it because it felt like, uh, I don't know if cheating is the right word, but it's like, I'm using PowerShell. Why the heck would I use .NET classes? Um, but use them. They're there. It's super powerful. Um, anybody that's used them before knows how easy it is to kind of explore what options are available. Um, through the console, so definitely use them. Um, and the Microsoft documentation on them is actually pretty, pretty solid. If you, uh, you might need it. I don't know. I don't know if they're solid for people that don't have development background at all, but they they, they generally tend to make sense. Um, and you can do a lot of stuff in there. Um, PowerShell can be coerced into creating nice UIs. Um, I definitely don't think that was the original intention when it was created, but uh, you can do it. Uh, definitely try to explore run spaces. Um, if you can get comfortable with them, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, again, on my blog, I've got a, I've got a series on uh, how to use run spaces effectively, so I would definitely check that out if, if it sounds like something interesting, especially if you've got situations where you need to do a lot of work in parallel. Um, it can be, can be really helpful. Um, and then finally, um, most of your admin scripts are in PowerShell already, or else you probably wouldn't be here. Um, so, you know, why not, uh, why not add a little UI niceness on there? All right, thank you. And uh, here's my contact information again. Um, I've got my presentation on, uh, on GitHub there. Um, these are links, aren't they? Yeah, they are, look at that. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, don't know how to share this with everybody, but um, if you go search for uh, SQL Top on GitHub, uh, it's, in a, it's in a repo uh, called Channel Advisor. Well, the owner is Channel Advisor because that's my employer. Um, it's something that we've we've open source. I do not have this in the gallery yet, but if you if you deal with SQL Server, I highly uh, encourage you to go check it out. Um, go back to your contact yeah, and then my blog is at markw.dev, um, where I have uh, I've got a few. Uh, it's primarily SQL Server stuff because that's my job, um, but I do have quite a bit of uh, PowerShell content as well, um, specifically around a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here. So, so check it out. All right, any, any other questions or anything? Yeah. Oh, no, so the question was how, uh, if I'm running SQL Top and I've got, you know, hundreds of servers, 
Uh, am I running it on each one of them? No, so I'm, it's, it's accessing them remotely via, uh, I don't remember what slide. Earlier on, um, I'm just making uh, SQL calls to them from my local box, or my jump box. So I've got SQL top installed on my jump box, and I can reach out to any server in my infrastructure from there. And, and, no, and run from there. Oh no, we are uh, we are one of those weird companies that is all on prem, um, because we, <laughs> as I said to the Amazon people yesterday, um, make an instance size that it has a good enough uh, memory to CPU ratio that I can actually run my workload there, and maybe we'll think about it. But um, no, we run really high memory workloads. Um, we average like 32 gigs per core for our SQL servers, um, and it's hard to find uh, it's hard to find cloud instances that can handle that. So yeah, we are 100% on prem. Yeah. <laughs> See? See? Yeah. Anthony doesn't think we're special, but yeah. I got water. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they did find one. They did find one for me. It's new. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.